read the chapter we go through it, but we're in Romans 11 tonight. Uh, let's have a word of prayer before we get into the word. Father, we thank you again for the privilege of being here. We remember uh, those who can't be here, particularly Brother David, and uh, how he's just uh, very weak and just having issues. We pray that you just would touch his body, Lord, and give him grace and strength. And uh, maybe after a good night's sleep, he'll be better tomorrow. But uh, just give grace to Sister Annette, too, and watch over her, Lord, and just uh, we commit them fully into you. And others, you know, they're dealing with other illnesses, and some of those we know are dealing with cancer treatments. And pray to us would guide and direct and all that they're doing as well. And uh, thank you for the tithes and offerings that were given throughout the day. Pray to just bless it that we can continue to do what we're able to do here and throughout the world with our missionaries. And just open our hearts to understand the truth of the scriptures here in Romans 11. We pray in your name. Amen. Let me games are going on right now, and uh, you know, typically the Olympic spirit is to try to finish, even if you may not come in first, the goal is to try to finish as best as you can. And God is in the business of finishing what he started. I read about some people who uh, at first, in their early years, were not considered to be much hope for them in their life, but thankfully they finished a lot better than they started evidently. One of them seemed to be so dull as a youth, his father thought he was incapable of learning and living in England. Thankfully, he persevered because his son's hap name happened to be Winston Churchill. I think he improved a lot over those years. Hmm? Or another one had a teacher who described him as addled, meaning just not right in the head. His own father convinced him that he was a dunce and had no chance whatsoever for success. Again, I'm glad that he persevered in his life because his name happened to be Thomas Edison. And I think he did quite well in his life. And then there's another man who performed so badly as a high school student, a teacher told him to drop out. The only course that seemed to do well in was math. His name happened to be Albert Einstein one of the greatest intellects of our world. So they all started out kind of bad, but they ended well. And Paul is talking about Israel in chapters 9 to 11 and asking what has happened to the nation of Israel, what's going to happen to them. And the answer is very clear. God has not finished with the nation of Israel yet. It's interesting, if you go back in history and you study prophetic uh, belief systems, prior to 1948, um, there was not much discussion in the church circles about Israel returning to their land. Because if you remind yourself, there was no nation of Israel from 70 AD all the way through to 1948. I mean, Israel existed, but not as a recognized nation. And those who study prophecy kind of just dismissed some of the prophets in the Old Testament because there was no nation of Israel, so it didn't seem possible. 1948, Israel becomes recognized as a nation again, and all of a sudden, the prophetic experts begin to change their viewpoint about life. All of a sudden, begin to realize perhaps God is not finished with Israel, and they began to look more over at the passages in Isaiah and Ezekiel and the other ones that promise a restoration of Israel to their land, and Messiah is going to reign, and, and they begin to realize that maybe things are not quite what we think they are. And I believe strongly God is not finished with Israel yet, and is based upon the covenants which he makes for them. But this is kind of, Paul's talked a little bit about uh, how God chose them in chapter 9, and then about some emphasis about the gospel again. In chapter 11, he's going to try to really wrap everything up and discuss it with the nation of Israel. And he says in verse 1, I say then, hath God cast away his people? Has he turned his back upon them and walked away from them? And in the Greek language, one of the interesting ways that they deal with things when they ask questions, there's a certain way that they ask questions, and you know what the answer is going to be. The answer in certain times is no. This question is phrased in such a way that it demands a no answer. We don't have to have that answer because Paul says, God forbid, or may it never be said, God will never turn his back upon his people and nation of Israel. And he says, I know that because I belong to the nation of Israel. And if God's turned his back upon them, he's turned his back upon me. And then he reminds us as how, 
God, God does not cast away people whom you foreknow. He said, you know, there were a lot of times in history where it looked like they were abandoned and forgotten. And he goes back to the time of Elijah. This is a time back in the prophets of Baal, back in 1 Kings chapter 18, where Elijah led the big challenge to the prophets of Baal and to try to convince Israel that uh, after this challenge is over, whoever lets fire come down, he is going to be God. And, of course, the prophets of Baal had all day long, nothing happened. He prayed like 30 seconds and fire came down, consumed up everything. And, and Elijah expected Israel then to bow their knee with Jezebel and Ahab and acknowledge Jehovah as the one and only God. Well, that didn't happen. Jezebel said, I'm going to make sure Elijah's dead if I can. And, and Elijah knew and realized Jezebel would never bow her knee to Jehovah and neither would Ahab. And so then in chapter 19, he takes off and tells God, I'm no good. I'm a failure. I've done my best. I'm the only one left that cares about you. So just take me home because I'm tired and weary. And we always should be thankful that God doesn't always answer our prayers. Because God wasn't finished with Israel. I mean, I, I really thought, I think about that, I tell my kids in the Old Testament survey. If God had ans answered his prayer, Elijah would have missed out upon that chariot of fire going to heaven. Okay, that would have been, that's a exciting thing to mess out on. I mean, of course, he didn't have no idea about that, but. God could say, hey, I got better plans for Elijah that's going to come down the road. But he, he said, I'm not done with you yet. You got a lot of stuff to get done here. Um, and, God didn't, you know, and God encouraged him. God had to show him a lesson. And part of the lesson was, he said, Elijah, I've got 7,000 people in my nation that have not turned their back to me. You may think you're the only one, but you're not. There's 7,000 people there. There's a, a remnant. There's a small group of people that are there. They love me. They follow me. And, and I'm working in a different way than what you think I'm going to work, but I'm there working in a great, wonderful way, in a still small quiet voice. So get back over there and do the work I've asked you to do. And Elijah slowly learns his lesson. And Paul applies that to here. He says, you know, there's a remnant here. God is still working. God hasn't abandoned Israel. It may look like that from our perspective. It may seem to be that way because what's going on, but he's saying no. There's always been a faithful few somewhere that God's going to work through and bring them back to him. And again, he emphasizes a very important point about all of life and about God. He says that all of this there and all what God's done to Israel is because of grace. If it's by grace in verse 6, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Other work is no more. So he says, you know, the whole point why Israel even exists is because of the abundant grace of God. God chose them because of his love and mercy. God has dealt with them because of his love and mercy. He could have turned his back upon them several times, but he never did. He made them a covenant promise to Abraham and to David, and he won't turn his back. But it has nothing to do with Israel. It has to do all with the grace of God. And what a blessing that grace is today. We celebrate the grace of God today. For by grace are we saved. It's not of works. It's all of grace. If it weren't for God's grace, we wouldn't be who we are. Like Paul says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Richard Baxter once wrote these words. As we paid nothing for God's eternal love and nothing for the son of his love and nothing for his spirit and our grace in faith and nothing for eternal rest, so then let deserved be written on the floor of hell, but then the door of heaven and life, the free gift. And that's true. We deserve the place called the lake of fire, but not God. It's all of grace. And Paul says that, all of grace. Well, again, again, ask the question again, verse 7. Well, what then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and rest work blind. He says, wait a minute. Okay, if, if, if God's working, then why are Israel seem like they completely are not there? I mean, he said, well, there, there's a few people there, but by and large, Israel as a nation is a spirit of slumber, he says in verse 8. Slumber is, is not sleep. It's kind of like you're in a, a mental fog, okay? You're just kind of running through life, and you're just not quite sure what's going on. I think years ago when I was in, playing basketball, I probably got a concussion. I don't know. I was behind a guy that was... a six foot four like I was, but he weighed like 270 pounds, all muscle. And I hadn't been behind him at the time. And he just, he pushed his elbow back and smacked me right in my face. And I went down. I didn't get knocked out, but I went down. My glasses got all bent up. But from that day on, that moment on, everything was like I was in a dream. 
I mean, I drove home, I did everything, and I was there, but it was like I was watching myself do stuff, you know? So I, I kind of feel like that's kind of like people say that's what a concussion was, you know, just kind of like out of it, and that's kind of just kind of like out of it. I just didn't know what was going on. Um, but then maybe that's the way I was anyway. I'm not really sure. Um, but, you know, it's just one of those things. And, and he says, Israel is like in a spiritual slumber. They're not paying attention to things. They're not, they're not listening to God. They're not watching God. Um, he says they had eyes that should not see, ears that should not hear. He talks about a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and recompense. Eyes are be darkened. Um, that is, God says, you know, I've sent my messages to them, but they haven't listened to me. They didn't pay attention. I sent my son to them, and he lived with them. He taught them, and they closed their eyes to him and did not come to him. And he said, that, that's, that's not without consequence. That doesn't mean, though, I've abandoned them. But it means that the reason why they're all in the shape they're in because of this reason. And he says, they've stumbled, verse 11, but, but have they stumbled that they should fall? And again, the answer demands a no. He says, okay, I can see that they're stumbling and not doing well, but have they gotten to the point where God has, again, rejected them and turned them aside. And he says, no, that's not what's happening. But what happened is that what happens to Israel has actually become a blessing to the entire world because he says, rather through their fall, in verse 11, salvation is coming to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. He says something happened and, and God changed his methodology of reaching people for him. In the Old Testament, his methodology was to choose one man, Abraham, and then one of his sons, and then one of those sons, and then 12 tribes of people, create them a nation called Israel, give them his law and revelation, so that as they lived out his law and revelation, the world would see that their God is the one and only God and come to worship him. And many times it worked. Most of the times it did not because they did not follow through on God's principles. They did not listen to him. They wanted to, as they told Sam, we want to be like everybody else in our world. And God would allow them to go ahead and do those things. There were consequences. But he said there came a tipping point, and that was when Jesus Christ came, and they rejected him as a nation. Caesar asked the leadership of Israel, what am I going to do to your king? And they said, we don't have a king but Caesar. A total rejection of Jesus Christ as Messiah. And when that happened, there was a change. And the new age begins called the church age. Jesus dies, he rises again from the dead, he possesses life. And now God says, I'm switching how I'm going to reach the world. I'm not going to reach the world through one nation. I'm going to reach the world through individuals, now reaching individuals, through what's called the body, the church of God. And that's what's going to change. Because they have stumbled and they decided they want to go in a different direction. I basically have just pushed them aside for a period of time of working in their nation and I'm going to reach the world in a different way. And so therefore, the entire world has been blessed because now the way to salvation is much simpler and easier than it's ever been before. Whosoever can come and find Christ and have life. And he says, that's what's happened. And he says, uh, you know, there's salvation coming to the Gentiles. And he said, the purpose is to try to get them to wake up to reality that they're my people and I still love them, but they still have to come the same way that everybody else comes, even though they haven't listened. And he says now in verse 12, but the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminution of the riches of the Gentiles have more their fullness. In other words, he goes, since they have been pushed aside because of their rejection of me, and it has resulted in a blessing for the world, what's going to happen when I bring back my nation of Israel and bless them? That's going to bring 20 times more blessing to the world at large. Now, the world doesn't see it that way, but that's what Paul is talking about. There's going to come a time that he's going to bring them back, and it's going to be a great blessing in every way, shape, and form. And he goes on to talk about the, the Gentile world and how they are blessed because of what's happened to them. And then he says, okay, let's use an analogy in verse 16. He talks about the first fruit be holy, the lump holy, the root holy, so are the branches. Um, all the gifts there in verses 14 and following really are more of a certainty. You know, since these things have happened. And he's going to use the analogy of a fruit tree. And what he's saying is that all of those things refer to Israel. They're the root, they're the tree, they're the branches, they're the fruit. And he says sometimes the branches get cut off of the tree. But you notice the tree doesn't get cut down. The root doesn't get cut down. The tree is still standing. There's the analogy he's trying to emphasize. You know, 
You can go to our neighbors just uh, the other day. They pruned all the branches, all the trees out in their yard. I mean, cut them down to like there's nothing but just nubs. Now, I do the same thing. There's a hedge next, next to the house. I, too, I cut that down so there's just things there. Not pretty at all. But I can guarantee you, by June, that is going to fill the entire section of my wall until I cut it down again. I mean, you look at it and go, oh, it's got to be dead. No, they're not dead. When you cut back the tree, it doesn't change. It actually makes the tree produce more. And so he's saying, okay, Israel's like a tree. And the branches have been cut off, so they look like they're dead. But he said they're not dead. The tree is still there. The roots are still there. It's still alive. And in fact, what God has done, he said, he has taken those branches that have been broken off, and he grafted in wild olive trees. And the wild olive trees are Gentiles or you and me. He says he's, he's grafted in other t- branches that are going to produce, become his people, which is the church. I mean, in essence, he's saying that we as the church owe a tremendous lot to the nation of Israel, which is very true, is it not? I mean, we, the Old Testament, the prophecies, um, our apostles all came from the Jewish nation. Jesus Christ himself was a member of the nation of Israel. All that we have grows out and springs out of the nation of Israel. And he is the same God that we worship. And so he says, we've all been connected together, so God's working in a new way, but he's still working through his own people. And then he warns the nation of Israel, the, nation, the Gentiles, you've got to be careful, though. He says, you know, there's a tendency with us, with everybody, to become proud over things. And he says, you've got to be careful, Gentiles, because he's talking really to the Gentiles there in the city of Rome. And he says, you know, hey, pay attention, um, because you may say, the branches are broken off so that I may be grafted in. In other words, they're going, oh, Israel's kind of pushed aside because we needed to get saved. Therefore, we are now more important than Israel. He says, hey, hey, got to be careful. Verse 20, be not high-minded, but fear. If God spare not the natural branches, take heed that he also spare not thee. Verse 22, behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. On them which fell severity on toward thee, goodness. If thou continue to goodness, otherwise thou shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide, still not in unbelief, shall be grafted in. Again, that is he saying, hey, listen, just because God's changed his methodology, is not working through individuals to reach others for him, don't get thinking that you're more important than anybody else. Don't make the same mistake Israel did. Don't begin to think you're all high and mighty and you're the reason why God's doing these wonderful things. He said, no, 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 you're, you're just... Someone that God loves and God put his grace upon you. Don't look down upon the nation of Israel and don't think that you're great and high and mighty because guess what? Um, God is still a God of love, but he's a God of justice and holiness. And if you reject him and you sin against him, guess what's going to happen? You're going to deal with the recompense of God as well. Israel disobeyed and God had to deal with them in punishment. If we disobey, God will do the same thing for us. He's a faithful God. Back in the uh, times of Joshua, when they got into Promised Land, they had two mountains called Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. And they divided the nation up, and, and they stood on them. And one was the Mount of Blessing, one was the Mount of Cursing. And they would go through the laws in Deuteronomy. they go, if we do this, do this, the blessing will come, the blessing will come. And then the other one would cry out, if we don't, this will happen, this will happen, this will happen. It was an object lesson. And if you look at Israel of Israel, everything that was on the Mount of Cursing happened to Israel because they wouldn't listen. Well, the God who promised you the blessings if you obey is the same God that promised you, I will deal with you if you disobey. And he's faithful. So if we disobey, we're going to have to pay the consequences. That's what he's trying to remind them of. He says, hey, listen, I know what God's doing, but, but don't get to the point where you don't understand stuff. Realize how you're blessing and always be thankful to God for those blessings, all right? Don't become like you think you're big, high, and mighty. No, no, you're not. God just loves you deeply. So just love him back and rejoice in what you have in Christ. Israel didn't do that, and so they've been pushed aside for a while, but that has been a blessing to you and for a moment in time. Then he says, verse 26, okay, how is it all going to work out? For I would not, brethren, that you be ignorant of this mystery, that you be wise in your own conceits. Meaning the mystery, of course, is a reference to the church, or to the focus that in Christ, everybody is one and the same. There is no Jew, there is no Gentile, there is no bond, there is no free, 
There is no male, there is no freeman. We are all one in Jesus Christ. That was a mystery. They didn't understand it. The Old Testament way of life, even when Jesus lived on earth, you had the Jew and you had the Gentiles. They stayed separated from each other. They, the Samaritans, they stayed separated from each other. They wouldn't mix. They wouldn't intermingle. When Jesus asked the woman of Samaria for a glass of water to drink, for water, she was stunned because the Israelites don't talk to the Samaritans. They just don't talk to them, period, about anything. They ignore each other. And the Jews were taught that if I touch a Gentile in the marketplace, I have to come wash my hands because if I don't and eat something, I become unclean. They wouldn't even say eat with a Gentile, much less touch a Gentile. And then all of a sudden, the church happens, and what does the Roman Empire see? Gentiles and Jews sitting next to each other, giving each other the food, hugging each other, you know, giving, shaking hands. Samaritans sitting next to the Jewish people, rejoicing and praising God getting on their knees and putting their hands around each other and praying for each other, and they're going, this is unbelievable. We've never seen anything like this before. And the nation of Israel never saw anything like that before. And they had to learn some lessons to figure all these things out. And he says, it's a mystery. It was not there in the Old Testament. It's brand new. It's coming on right now. And it happened because blindness, in part, happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. He said, this is where we are. God's pushed Israel aside for a period of time, but there's going to come a point in time when the fullness of the Gentiles will come in. And when that happens, verse 26, all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion to deliver and to turn away the ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant unto them when I should take away my sins. God promised in Jeremiah chapter 31, I think, if I remember right, or 33, that there's going to be a new covenant made with Israel. A covenant will be in their hearts and they will be changed dramatically. That new covenant was initiated by Jesus Christ, but it will not be applied to the nation of Israel until the future. That's what he's talking about. There's going to come a time in the future when the nation of Israel, everybody who belongs to the nation of Israel, will be fully, completely saved, just like you and I are. Now, that hasn't happened yet, obviously. The nation of Israel exists, but they're not saved. He said that's not going to happen until the Deliverer comes back to earth. And that's not going to happen until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. So that's the key phrase in this whole chapter. And years gone by, the predominant focus was the fullness of the Gentiles means the last person to be saved through faith in Christ on earth. And thus, many times there was a push for mission to see. We want Jesus to come back again, so let's get out there and get those people saved. Because there's one person left, we got to go find that one person. That, that might be true, I don't know. I have a different take on it. And this is kind of goes back to what I talked to back, back near Christmas time. Um, that we go back to Daniel 9 and de- to the concept of God's going to do work among his people Israel. And those, those goals and objectives in Daniel 9 reflect this verse here that all Israel will be saved. It's the same goal and outcome. And he says, I'm going to start the work and it's going to go for 490 years. And after 490 years, this will happen. Israel will be saved. In the beginning time frame, we believe is Nebuchadnezzar when he comes back to rebuild the wall to Jerusalem. 483 years come and go in succession without any problem. And then Daniel says in Daniel 9, verse 27, something happens. After those 483 years, Messiah will come, and then he'll be cut off, and the city will be destroyed, and there's still a one week left or seven more years to come. And is the crucifixion. Jerusalem, Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. So there's already a gap of 30 some odd years. And what Paul, what God is saying is that, you know, I, I worked with Israel before, but, but when Messiah came into Jerusalem and proclaimed Messiah on triumphal entry, that's when they began to reject my son. And therefore I stopped my prophetic time clock of 490 years. I, I pushed pause and I pushed Israel aside, and then I began to bless the whole world and change my methodology of reaching the world with the church, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and individuals. He said, that's what I'm doing now. That's what's happening now. Israel's just pushed aside for a time. But there's going to come a time when he's going to go back to those Israel and finish those seven years, and that's going to be when the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Those seven years, we know, are what's called the Great Red Tribulation in Revelation 6 to Revelation 18. Jesus talks about an element discourse as well. 
It's going to happen at the end of those seven years. Jesus comes back to the earth, puts his feet in the Mount of Olives, and judges all the nations, and then restores Israel, and all who are alive on the earth at that point in time will be saved. All Israel will be saved. That's what it means. The only ones left on earth are going to be those who believe and trust in Christ, and, and they are saved, and he begins his thousand-year reign. Before that happens, I told you before, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul outlines that certain things have to happen. The man of sin has to be on the scene, which is, of course, the fellow who initiates the last seven-year period with the peace treaty with Israel. And then he also says there has to be a fallen away first, and then the restrainer that keeps evil in check has to be removed, and then finally the Antichrist will come on the scene publicly. Well, the falling away, the apostasy, I think that's the same thing as the fullness of the Gentiles in, Revelation, in Romans chapter 11. See, in my perception, God is a God of order. He basically works consistently. Why did he push Israel aside? Because as a nation, they rejected him and said, we don't want your son. He said, okay, fine. I'm not going to push you aside completely. I love you, and I made a covenant with you, but... For now, we're just going to push you aside, okay? And I'm going to change to work with the world in a different way. And he's doing that now. I think there's going to come a time when the world at large, the Gentiles, will say the same thing to God and say, we're done with you, we don't want you, we're not interested with you anymore, we're finished. And God would say, okay, that's fine. Son, go get your bride and bring her home. Because now it's time to restart my work with Israel, bring them back into the fold, and finish what I started with them way back in 486 B.C. Now, if you look at the history of the church and evangelicalism, it's always been the Western world that's held the torch for Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not saying there's not other places do that, but I mean, if you, if you pay attention, it was Rome, and then Europe, and then Americas, because we're out of Europe. And that's the Western world. And by and large, even up to this day, it's the Western world that has pushed missions and the gospel throughout the world. And America has been, for the last uh, 50 or so years, the nation that upheld truth of God and presented it clearly. I mean, people around the world would know America as a Christian nation, founded on God's principles, send out more missionaries and have more admission agencies probably than ever has ever been done in the entire world. The northern kingdom has already abdicated Christ. Already rejected Christ. The southern kingdom, the Arab world, has already rejected Jesus Christ. There's only one world left to say to him, we're not interested, and that's the western world at large. And America primarily. Europe has already completely cast God aside. They're not interested in God anymore. You know how close we are in America to getting that done today? We're close. I mean, most of you can look at your lifetime and see an America that at one time was standing with God, on the side of God, and up for God, has now not just rejected God and pushed him aside, they are now attacking those who stand up for God's truth and considering them the enemy above everything else. In other words, the Western world's just at that point where they're saying to God, we're not interested in your stuff anymore. We're tired of it. We don't want your truth. We think it's all fake and all phony. We want to live life our way and do things what we think is best. And we just wait for the moment in time, which we don't know when or where, when he will say to his son on the right side, go get your bride, please. Bring her home. And the trumps of sound. The dead in Christ shall rise. And if we're alive, boom, we're caught up instantly with them. Then all of Israel shall be saved. That's what he's talking about. He says, God's not finished. God's still got seven years to go, but it's not going to happen until the fullness of the Gentiles come in and until I believe we're gone. And then he's going to finish the work. And the good news is you and I are going to be there when it happens because we're coming with him at that time. You know, when I stood at the plain of Megiddo in Israel, um, about the only place I think brought tears in my eyes, if I remember right, because it's a beautiful plain. But that is the place where the Battle of Armageddon is to be fought. That is the place where the Western world and the Eastern world come together to fight each other for the conquering of the world. And that is when they look up in the sky and they see Jesus on his white horse. 
And I looked at the plane and I said, I may never come back a lifetime, literally to this place, but I will be here once again. And the sad truth was, about tears, is that millions of my fellow humans will die because they won't come to Jesus Christ that day. But I'll see it again one day. Everybody will, because we'll be with him one day. That's what Paul's teaching and emphasizing. Then after he says all of that, then he goes on, he says, you know, this is, this is who God is. The last few verses of, of Romans there in chapter 11 all talk about basically, again, the grace of God. He says, you know, this is how God works. Concerning the gospel, they're enemies for your sake, but touch election, they're beloved for the Father's sake. It sounds kind of confused, but basically all he's saying is that God always deals with man on the same basis. Mercy and grace and love. And if they come by faith and accept what he's given to them, they will be blessed abundantly. But if they reject him, then they shall face judgment. It's no different. God's not going to change anything. He dealt with Israel that way. He'll deal with us that way. He'll deal with everyone that way. And then he sums it all up in these wonderful verses in verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches of both the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him, and through him, and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. He says the riches are so deep we can't even begin to even fathom what they're like, and the wealth that he has. He talks about the wisdom, the knowledge of God. We, we don't understand those things. The things that he decides to do and how he works and operates are, are beyond our capability to understand. We can't figure them out. Even though he gives us some understanding and guidance, we still can't figure it out. Why is he even dealing with Israel? If I were God, I would have wiped them off the map a long time ago. I would have not listened to Moses. I always said, I'm done with him. Gone. Why does he deal so graciously with us? Why is he long-suffering? I don't know why he does. And we can even get the impersonal things. You know, why does he allow this to happen or this to happen to somebody? Why does this take place and this doesn't take place? Why do we have to go through this and someone else has to go through? Why? No one knows why because we can't understand how God works in the world, in the nations, in the universe, in our own personal lives. All Paul says, you know what we should be doing? We don't understand it, so here's what we should be doing. We just give God praise and trust him every step of the way and praise him and praise him and praise him. Because he is a greater God than we can ever imagine. And just realize he knows exactly what he's doing because everything comes out of him. Everything is because of him. And everything is directed to him. And in the end, we are going to be worshiping him with all of our heart and all of our life. And every nation shall be there. So... Don't try to figure God out or how God's doing. Just trust him and rejoice that he's in charge because in the end, his way shall be accomplished. That's kind of like the message of Paul. He made a covenant in Israel and he will care of the covenant. He is a faithful God and he will do all that he's promised. So trust him and give him praise and give him the glory that's due unto his name. That's just how we respond day in and day out, no matter what goes on in our life and our world. Someone called uh, Julia Herrick Johnston, born in 1849, daughter of a Presbyterian minister. She loved to write about missionaries and missions. She loved the good news of Jesus Christ, and she was just overwhelmed with the grace of God. She probably was studying Romans chapter 5, verse 20, which says, Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And she thought about that grace of God. And as she thought about that, she wrote these words of praise to God. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder in Calvary's mouth outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilt. Sin and despair like the sea waves cold threatened the soul with infinite loss. Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold, points to the refuge, the mighty cross. Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. Why can it avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide, whiter than snow you may be today. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that are parted and cleansed within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Kind of, that's the message to me of Romans chapter 11. Why is Israel still in God's hand working? Because of his grace. Grace. 
Why are we here? Because of his grace. Why do we have a future looking forward to seeing Jesus again? Because of his grace. We don't understand it. We can't explain it. All we can do is rejoice in it and give him praise for who he is. God's abundant and amazing grace has made us what we are. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and what it means to us. We thank you that you are still working in your nation of Israel. and We're going to see it happen one day. But until whatever happens, Lord, until it comes, even though we get troubled sometimes and dismayed by what we see going around around us and our governments, remind us that everything comes out of you. Everything is directed towards you. Your plan will be accomplished. You're working out your will in our personal life, in our life as a church, in our life as a nation. And we just need to step back and trust you, step out and follow you and obey you and rejoice in the abundant grace that you have given to us day in and day out. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.